Science is much more than just one cultural enterprise among others today. In fact, as the new atheists have made clear, science is often seen as a replacement for religion. As we'll shortly see, this idea has been brewing for centuries. The goal of this lecture series is to think more deeply about nature, to think more critically about modern science, and to develop a healthy view of the proper role and place of science today. But this is a lot harder than it sounds. Tired of being browbeaten by phrases like science says with a capital S, and weary of being told that science supports any number of anti-Christian causes, some Christians feel embattled. When you feel lied to by mainstream scientific institutions, it's easy to find oneself overly skeptical of even modest scientific claims. Most of us gravitate to another unhealthy extreme, though. Since we rightly believe that all truth is God's truth and that the truth won't contradict itself, we throw our hands up in the air. We say, let science do its thing. We, in effect, disengage. We turn our brains off, and we agree to go along with whatever scientists happen to claim at the moment. We thus cede to science an unhealthy degree of authority. We tell ourselves that we take this stance because we're sophisticated, we're educated, we, won't, we don't want to be fundamentalist cranks. The truth, though, I'm afraid, is that what we have is a Galileo complex. Claims that the church mistreated Galileo and that this is only one of a great many examples of a war between science and religion make us anxious to declare a truce with science. I'm afraid, though, that this retreat leads Christianity. It just leaves it with no public, observable content. We retreat into a very privatized religion, and we cede the public arena to the world. Instead of taking every thought captive for Christ, we offer the Lord our hearts, and we give the world our minds. Hence, we must begin today by looking more carefully at the poster child for the supposed conflict or war between science and Christianity. We've got to revisit the Galileo affair. One hears so many different claims about Galileo, from the media to science textbooks, that it's actually difficult to even know where to start. On the standard story, church authorities persecuted Galileo because they found his ideas threatening. The church was wedded to a false cosmology dictated by the Bible and ancient authorities like Aristotle. And so when Galileo argued rationally for a Copernican, heliocentric view of the world, with mounds of scientific evidence, he was given the worst possible treatment. He was imprisoned in dungeons, forced into silence. His works were banned as heretical, and he was even tortured, according to figures like Voltaire, by the Roman Inquisition. All because of the perceived threat of the new science, all for just speaking truth to power. The church's false ideas and its very authority were threatened by the new discoveries in science. In particular, Christianity insisted that human beings have a special place in the universe, and thus church authorities refused to see the truth that we're not actually at the center of the cosmos, at the center of reality. Stephen Hawking even claims that Galileo was persecuted because he was the first person to claim that humanity can understand the workings of the world by observation. Rather than accepting the clear truth of rational argumentation, what did the church do? The church blindly dug in its heels. And this shows, of course, that this is just what religion does. In truth, the Galileo affair is not a secular science versus Christianity type of story at all. All parties were Christian, including the protagonist. Galileo defended his understanding of the relative autonomy of modern science, for instance, by appealing to St. Augustine's famous metaphor of the two books the book of scripture and the book of nature. Both are written by God, he insisted. And no mention is made in these narratives of his many friendships within the Catholic hierarchy. Historians point out that Galileo's chief rivals were actually the Aristotelian natural philosophers, right? Natural philosophy is what we used to call science. His chief rivals were these Aristotelian secular natural philosophers who decried his, his Copernican heliocentrism. They were a large part of the reason that the machinery of the Inquisition was wielded against Galileo. As one revered Galileo historian comments, quote, it has been known for a long time that a major part of the church intellectuals were on the side of Galileo, while the clearest opposition came from secular ideas. It can be proved further that the tragedy was the result of a plot of which the hierarchies themselves turned out to be victims no less than Galileo. 
an intrigue engineered by a group of obscure and disparate characters in strange collusion who planted false documents in the file, who later misinformed the Pope, and then presented him a misleading account of the trial for decision, end quote. In this light, the morality tale might be seen as more of a lesson about how heterodox academics are treated in the academy than one about, say, anti-intellectualism in religion. The Aristotelian Ptolemaic system was very well established at the time, and we all know how petty academics can be when they're challenged. Complicating that narrative is also the fact that the Galileo affair came in the wake of the Reformation. It's crucial to understand that context. The Catholic Church had been accused of not taking you know, the Bible seriously enough, and taking tradition too seriously. So part of the story here is that the church could not be seen as too quickly abandoning a straightforward reading of the scriptures that was supported by the church fathers. Scriptural passages that were most naturally read as supporting geocentrism were hung on to in this case by the church. Ironically, as the legend grew, this episode became yet another reason for Protestant skepticism uh, about the Catholic church. Despite the fact that many in the church hierarchy actually supported heliocentrism, and despite much of the conflict between Galileo and the church was over biblical interpretation or how to deal with these biblical passages, the conflict is consistently represented as a conflict over science. In addition to all this, we must add the particular personalities involved, the personalities of Galileo and Pope Urban VIII. It is notable that Copernicus himself did not run afoul of the church authorities, but somehow Galileo did. If you've read Galileo, you probably found that you actually didn't like him very much. He's not quite the hero that you were told. He had no patience for anyone who disagreed with him, and he insisted that the church immediately endorse his point of view like it was the obvious truth. He's hardly a model of academic civility and, and dispassionate argumentation. At the same time, the Pope, Pope Urban VIII, was a human being with an ego as well. He seemed overly anxious to be seen as a defender of scripture and the faith in these turbulent times. The Pope wished that his own arguments would find its way into Galileo's work, into, in particular into his dialogue concerning the two chief world systems in 1632. It was only after Galileo mocked him by putting these arguments in the mouth of a character called Simplicio, the foolish philosopher, that the Pope banned the sale of the book and asked that a special commission look into the work. Galileo got in trouble for actually going back on his promise not to teach that heliocentrism was literally and absolutely the truth, but rather, rather than say, just teaching heliocentrism in general. Instead of teaching the controversy and, and both sides of the argument, he insisted upon his view. Lastly, consider how complex the question of the new Copernican system actually was. It involved questioning a model that had stood the test of time for centuries and centuries. There was a complex question of scriptural interpretation. There were epistemological questions about what kind of weight one attaches to philosophical argumentation versus you know, empirical observation and new experimental equipment. There were complex data sets of astronomical observations to wade through that most historians will tell you now the data fit the Ptolemaic model better than the Copernican model. Even careful and competent astronomers like Tycho Brahe did not abandon geocentrism as much more decisive for heliocentrism was more than a century off. The church was far from unreasonable in the end for urging some caution and continued discussion. Galileo, however, just wouldn't have any of it. This was hardly a simple case of the church blindly clinging to tradition uh, or, or reason versus superstition. In the end, Galileo was censured by authorities, but we need to understand that he was sent to live off of a church pension in a Tuscan villa. This was hardly the torture that uh, Voltaire envisioned. In light of all this, we have to ask ourselves a question. How can such falsehood persist? How is it the case that all of us can have these false ideas in our minds? And why is the Galileo affair taken on such prominence in our rendering of intellectual history. Later in this course, we'll discuss the historical origins of many of these tales in the late 19th century. But for now, let's think about the role that such rhetoric plays in our society. Professor of Communication Studies Thomas Lessel suggests that, that there's a number of reasons for this scientific folklore in the Galileo legend. The scientific community, like any other group of human beings, has ideals and practices that it wishes to convey to the next generation. 
No less than any other group, it seeks to enculturate neophytes and bring them up in the way they should go so that they can practice their scientific craft. This leads them to project a certain image of science and of scientists to their young pupils and, quite frankly, to the rest of our culture. Recognizing this helps to understand the mythology surrounding the Galileo affair. It is part history and part fiction, all in the service of enculturation. Lasso suggests that group cohesion is often built by identifying the true members of the community and separating them from the out-group. So you're building up the culture of the in-group by separating them from someone else. The Galileo legend and its surrounding tales of Giordano Bruno and others tells a narrative of brave scientists whose virtues of, of patient evidence gathering and careful reasoning that we all want to emulate, it shows them being besieged by the forces of superstition, irrationality, and blind faith. The church has been made to play the latter role, not only in science, but of course in pop culture generally. When the drama needs a conflict, writers can always draw upon the trope of blind religious believers who oppose reason and progress in the name of tradition. It's not hard to see how this cultural meme delegitimizes religious belief and traditional religious structures. What's less recognized is how this tale has led to the institution of science replacing religious institutions as a recognized authority in our culture. This is hard for us to see precisely because we've been taught since kindergarten about the neutrality and dispassionate nature of the sciences and of scientists. We've come to think that they engage in a special method, a special kind of reasoning that the rest of us could only dream to emulate. These claims of special objectivity and neutrality have given the institutions of science an incredible power and cultural significance. If the Pope supports some proposed legislation, say, it hardly makes the news. But if the National Academies of Science weigh in, then we, we start to see it as neutral and objective, not biased like those religious figures. In fact, science as an institution has basically become immune to religious critique. If two talking heads on cable news are debating, say, the morality of some issue, and one you know, is wearing a priest collar and is speaking religious rhetoric, and if the other is a scientist in a white lab coat, you know, speaking the, the supposedly neutral language of science, we all know who wins automatically. It doesn't matter what the content of the debate is. That, that tells us something about the role and perceived authority of science in our culture. Whether we admit it or not, I think that we Christians have been taken captive by this modern narrative. Even if we don't fully embrace the Galileo legend, right, we, we, we're, we're a little bit wary of it, we hesitate to cross swords with science. We're happy to settle for relative autonomy in narrow matters of faith and morals. Yet the scriptures claim that the heavens declare the glory of God and that his power and divinity are revealed in nature. Now, we need not constantly challenge the scientific consensus. My goal is not to turn us all into cranks who can't ever accept any sort of scientific consensus. We need not constantly just be these cranky skeptics on the internet, right? But if we seek a coherent worldview and not merely a privatized religion in our hearts that has nothing really to offer and to say to the world, it's imperative that we remove a bit of the mystique and that we start to develop a healthier view of science. That is, we've got to finally shed our Galileo complex. In order to regain this healthier perspective on science, we've got to do some serious investigation of pre-modern views of nature, the scientific revolution, and its aftermath. It is to the ancient views of nature that we turn next.